All right, welcome back to another episode of Friends from Work. I'm Kyle Sconewill, he's Robbie Earl, and today we are joined by a very special guest, John Pazino. Yes, that John Pazino. He joined us on this podcast two years ago. He is music composer extraordinaire, and we had such a good time talking to him last time about his work on Daredevil, his work on the first Spider-Man video game, Miles Morales, amongst other things. Mm -hmm. And I am so stoked to have him back on now that I'm finished with Spider-Man 2. He crushed it there, and I'm excited for you guys to hear from him. And I think it's it's telling that we can have a an almost 40-minute conversation with John about his Spider-Man 2 music and not even talk about the level in the video game where you're literally composing the <laughs> Miles theme. <laughs> yeah, oh yeah, the as DJ part track. Of the fight. Yeah. Uh, cuz I don't I mean that that's the thing. John is so he's so generous with his time and it's so fascinating to hear him unpack all this that I think uh, if left to our own devices, we would keep him here all day. That's true. Uh, but we try not to do that uh, for his sake and y'all's. So this is a really fun conversation about Spider-Man 2 and, and also a, a new project he's working on that we're really excited about. So without further ado, give it up for John Pazano. All right, John, welcome back to Friends from Work. Let's go. Right. It's been a couple of years since we last talked to you. And by the way, yeah. our yeah. listeners, uh, if they want to hear that episode, they can find it somewhere. We talked about Daredevil and the first Spider-Man and Miles yeah. Morales, so much good stuff. But- a lot has changed since then, I mainly the fact that I am now 100% through Spider-Man 2. Oh, my sure. gosh, what a game. <laughs> Let's go. Yeah. yeah, no, it's pretty cool. It, they did an amazing job on it. It's funny, since we had talked, I know it seems like a long time, but I feel like I've just been working on Spider-Man all the way through that time. These games yeah. are such long projects. <laughs> you know what I mean? You, you kind of never really stop working on them, you know, just because they yeah. take so long to develop and and get through. So even though there was kind of a, a healthy break between them, it, there was really no break as far as, you know, <laughs> with, with yeah. what I was doing and so with insomniac and so and PlayStation. So it's a, uh, you know, these games are such long, long projects. Yeah. It's, it's funny because we've, I've, I am not a hundred percent. I'm like 80%. So I'm, I'm treading <laughs> lightly here. Uh, but yeah. it, it is, it just worked out that uh, we're doing a, a daredevil, rewatch at the yeah. same time that Kyle and I have been playing Spider-Man 2 and kind of talking about it. So I am just purely oh, immersed <laughs> in your yeah. music. <laughs> yeah, there you go. 24-7. <laughs> okay, <was> very sorry. <laughs> no. No, it's a great place to be. <laughs> You're not going to find bigger fans than the two people you're talking to right now. So, uh, cool. John, here's the thing. I have three kind of thematic questions I want to ask you and then two nerdy questions. Yeah. Uh, the three themes I want you to just take me behind the curtain on, yeah. okay? One, okay. I want to say, what a spectacular job in combining your Spider-Man and Miles Morales themes, putting them together for a track like Greater Together, obviously the opening title right. card song. Uh, was that a fun challenge? Take me through that process of combining I mean, it was hard. Two. Like, I remember when that, when we initially talked, when Brian and I had initially talked about, you know, what we wanted to do kind of for like the main menu and for, you know, kind of like our, our kind of main title flagship queue. It was tricky because, you know, Spider, we had, obviously we had the DNA of Spider-Man and then we had the DNA of Miles and it was tricky to try to figure out you know, this this is a Spider-Man game. It's not a Miles Morales game, but because Miles' imprint on the game is so strong, we just couldn't go straight to Peter Parker and not have any of that DNA in there. So I remember like my first V1 version one that we did of that. It was it was very, very Peter Parker centric. And it was kind of like an old, you know, there's this idea that like, you know, do we want to kind of give people the nostalgia of that 2018 title of, you know, doing that Peter Parker theme, highly orchestral, you know, very kind of in that Marvel sound universe of yesteryear, so to speak. Um, or do we want to completely up Updated and make it something new and it would be like you know I always have the approach of I I mean I love I grew up on John Williams and Jerry Goldsmith mm. and John mm -hmm. you know classic film scores and um I always loved I never as a as a you know as a as a fan of film music before I even did it I never got tired when like I never got sick of John Williams score <laughs> for no. Empire or Star Wars or Jedi and even though they are all predominantly orchestral it never bumped me to be like, oh my God, it's just the same old 
crap again. Right. You know what I mean? I loved it. Like I was like, ah, oh, it's so cool. It was like more of the same. You know what I mean? And I always loved that. And I always appreciated that as a fan. But, you know, I also think people, you know, have a creative itch to, you know, want to, you know, do something different and new and give the audience and the fans something new and interesting. And so there was a little bit of a kind of back and forth as far as like how we handle this and how we want to do it. And, the, you know, the little kid in me and the film scoring fan in me always just kind of wanted to do more of the same of kind of what we had done. I know like Sony and, and um, Insomniac also, they loved it and they, they loved that idea too. But they also were like, you know, we also want to try to, you know, give the audience and give the fans something new as well. And so I think the cool thing was, is we kind of had all this Miles DNA that mm -hmm. kind of gave me both, you know what I mean? It kind of was like, okay, cool. We could do Peter Parker, but we can also get the DNA of Miles in there and it's going to kind of make it new and fresh, but also at the same time, hold on to some of that nostalgia, you know, from, from the fan base to kind of have both those. So it's not like we took, you know, the Peter Parker theme and made it fully electronic, you know what I mean? Like right. We, right. we were able to kind of take the Miles world and kind of, you know, bring it into the Peter, bring it kind of into Peter's world as well. And it kind of gave us this new fresh thing without, you know, completely blowing up the, uh, the, the, the old Peter Parker theme as well. So it, it, it kind of, everybody kind of got their wish, I think at the end of the day, but it is, it's tricky. You know what I mean? You, you're always trying to figure out, um, you know, it's, it's, again, it's never, whenever you go into these scores, whether it's, you know, film, television, video games, it's never, I never really get to write, exactly what I want to do. You know what right. I mean? It's always a collaboration. And I think that's always the tricky thing for young composers when they get in this business. They always think they're going to just be able to waltz into these projects and do whatever it is they want to do, you know, whatever they feel. No, but you're, you're a craftsman. You know, you have to, you come in there, people tell you, mm -hmm. um, you know, I always, I always make this crude analogy. I'm sure other composers hate it, but I always make this crude analogy of like, we're, we're, we're cabinet makers. You know what I mean? We come in, people tell us we want this type of cabinet with this type of wood and this type of hardware on it. And, and it's my job to say like, well, you know, this wood's going to go way better with your floors if you use this wood. And they might, they might say, oh, that's awesome. Yeah, let's do it. Or they might go, no, we want this type of wood. <laughs> you know, so you, mm -hmm. it's not always what you want to do. You know, these are big franchises and they're, they're, they're run by, you know, we're just a small little portion of it, the music, you know. So you kind of have to know your place in the line and, and, and contribute to what you can. And I think these main titles, there's a lot of opinions kind of coming into them and but i i'm i'm like really really happy with the way it turned out oh um, yeah and I think it was i think it was successful oh i feel like the end result is a perfect mashup because one of the best things about playing a game like this where there's both characters robbie and i have talked a lot about how each spider-man feels distinct in their movement in what yeah. they can actually do but i appreciate that you keep that distinctness in the musical themes as yeah. well so it, like on one hand you hear the two distinct themes, you know, with like the 808 type beat stuff yeah, that comes yeah. in. But at the same time, it it works so perfectly together that you you almost start losing track of which one is which as you're going along, if that yeah. makes sense. Yeah, and I think it's kind of one of the th one of the things that's been really nice about, you know, working with with Insomniac and PlayStation is they're very very um theme centric you know, mm. they, they they approach these scores with themes in mind, you know what I mean? And mm -hmm. I, I know that sounds like a no brainer, but you'd be surprised how many people are allergic to having musical themes, hmm. traditional hmm. musical themes in scores. Do you know what I mean? You, Interesting. There's, it's not that scores aren't thematic anymore because they are, but the traditional, mm -hmm. you know, uh, you know, motific kind of thematic scores that we, of yesteryear, whether it was John Williams or Jerry Goldsmith, where they were, mm -hmm. you know, those guys basically had the orchestra to work with and that was mm -hmm. it. They didn't have all the tools at their fingertips that we have today with all the hybrid material and all the sound mm. design. And they had to make the orchestra sound unique to themselves. And the way they did that is they used melodic content to do it. They used thematic material. And that's how you could separate a John Williams from a Jerry Gold. So you would know their themes, you know, and it became mm -hmm. this very um, important thing in film scoring. And as more instruments, and as I'm pointing around the studio to synths and stuff, as more uh, technology mm -hmm. crept into scores, people started becoming thematic using other things besides just themes, whether they're big, you know, sound effects or, mm -hmm. you know, a very unique sound, you know, like, you know, Hans did it with the Joker and um, mm -hmm. when he did mm -hmm. Dark Knight, you know what I mean? You kind of had this sound that that became the thematic element of it, you know, and I can never hum it for you, but if I heard it, I'd go, <laughs> oh, that's, right. you know, it's just as, it's just as effective as doing, you know, 
the the motific theme that John Williams uses for Star Wars that everyone knows and loves. So with PlayStation and Insomniac, they've been very, very supportive of using melodic content for our like identifiers for these for these games. And I think what that's done though is it's helped us to be able to shape and use these themes and, and help tell stories with them in a way that um, you can kind of, in a very quick amount of time, you can really get that thematic material in there and, and mm-hmm. the, the, the player or the audience automatically knows kind of where they are. So it's it's been nice to be able to to, to work with them in that regard just because they do kind of have a, a, a kind of an old school mentality when it comes to that. When you were on here last time, uh, mm-hmm. we were kind of talking about just all of the takes on Spider-Man musically. Yeah. Uh, from the various TV shows to movies to video games. Yeah. And we talked about kind of how, you know, you can't, even if you're not trying to channel any influences, it's also kind of hard to separate yourself from yeah. just knowing that that's sort of the background and the history you're stepping into. You know, back then we we, talk, we talked about, which makes sense now, that you actually really enjoyed the Christopher Young Spider-Man 3 score. Yeah. Uh, and I definitely feel like I, I heard some hints of that being channeled in a way that's so, again, so natural and so fitting within the score that you created in the first two games. But, you know, you also just now talked about kind of Sony and Insomniac speaking into things and and what they support and are excited about. And I'm just curious, uh, of all of the things that you can channel, uh, whether it's Spider-Man Project of the Past or like Across the Spider-Verse, which is, you know, coming out a couple months before Spider-Man yeah. 2 here. Um, is that a conversation that you're having with some of the folks at Insomniac and, and Sony? Or is that all just kind of purely up to you, like how much you channel things? Uh, yeah, that's a great question. I think, you know, one of the biggest you know, not only do I have to, you know, not only do we have to like write these scores, we also have to produce them as well. So I, and, and in that, and in that conversation kind of covers what you're talking about being a fan of, like I said, I was a, before I even wrote a lick, before I even knew how to play an instrument, I was a huge fan of film music. Film music got me into playing music. I mean, that's what hmm. I wanted. Hmm. I became a, such a fan. I was like, as a little kid, I was like, I have to learn how to do this. You know what I mean? And hmm. I, um, it, it kind of drove me into music versus mm-hmm. like I was into music and I was like, Oh, this is cool to write music for a film. Like I never, I always just knew right away. It, listen, if I, if I couldn't write music to film or television or anything else, I probably wouldn't be a composer to be quite honest with you. <laughs> I really wouldn't. It's I love writing music to picture. Like that's what I, for better or worse, you know what I mean? And, and cool. like sometimes it hurts you as much as it helps you. You know what I mean? You would think to be someone, but like sometimes people like working with an artist and I'm like, well, I'm a film composer. Like I consider myself <laughs> a film composer. You know what I mean? Um, Interesting. So I've always been a huge, and I think that's why I work on such a wide variety of things. You know what I mean? I work in animation. I work in video games. I work on film. I work in drama. I work in cartoon. Mm-hmm. Because I've always loved coming home and buying the latest soundtrack that was out there when I was a kid and going, oh man, this is really cool. How did... You know, how did he, how did John Williams do this? Or, oh, this man, look at this cool hybrid stuff Harry Gregson did in phone booth. I want to like, how did hmm. he do this? Like, you know what I mean? He's got all this cool reverse stuff. How is he doing that reverse piano thing? I would always be delved into like all that. these different things. So I think with that mentality in mind, when I do kind of to come back to your original question, when I do get into these scores, I'm always thinking of it from like an audience perspective too, like as a fan of all this stuff, you know, like when I was a little kid, what would get me excited about hearing these soundtracks? And um, it's really hard to work on a game like Spider-Man and just try to ignore everything that's come before you, especially in, you, you have to realize that these games and this, these, these characters were just stewards of the, the, the content and I think it's your job to really have that in mind. Like, why do people love these characters? You know, what has come before mm-hmm. us? What's going to come after us? I think it would be kind of somewhat irresponsible just to, like, take Spider-Man and be like, you know what? I'm just going to do what John Paisano wants to do with this character and the, mm-hmm. the hell with the rest of this stuff. I mean, there's – and I, I respect people that do that. <laughs> but me being such a big fan of the stuff and growing up as a fan, I kind of selfishly do what I think my nine-year-old self would want to hear – Hmm. If I had done this, Hmm. you know what I mean? If I had bought this soundtrack and I think that it's really hard for that to kind of not for me, at least to creep into the concept of these, 
of all the, not just this, but everything I work on. I mean, I feel like I work on a lot of stuff that is um, very commercial, you know, whether it's, whether it is a daredevil or whether it's a Spider-Man, um, mm-hmm. you know, currently right now I'm working on a, I'm working on a Planet of the Apes project. For, Let's go. Uh, yes. And um, like, it's hard for me not to think about that as well when I'm working on something like that, just to ignore all this DNA. And it's not just, you know, for Spider-Man, it's not just what, Danny Elfman had done or Chris mm-hmm. Young had done, but yeah, it also bleeds into what Daniel, what Pemberton's done on mm-hmm. Spider-Verse it also bleeds a little bit into, you know, Michael's obviously Michael Giacchino scores mm-hmm. a huge influence on this stuff. I mean, it's mm-hmm. like, mm-hmm. so you, and, and the, and not just specifically, but then there's also the greater talk of Marvel. You know what I mean? The Marvel's has a sound to it. How dark is it? How light is it? You know, what's that balance? You know, so um, I think you're, we're always trying to, and then at the same time too, yes, we are trying to, we're not just trying to like go in there and extract all that DNA and that's the score, but then we're also doing our, you know, Brian, you know, the, the Atari has his own vision of what he wants the score to be as well. So we're trying to keep all this stuff mm-hmm. kind of, and that's what makes these games a little tricky. You know, it's like, how do you make these scores fit all this criteria, but at the same time to make them your own as well? Yeah. And, um, and so, yeah, it's always, it's always a challenge with these like big franchise things that have a super long history and Spider-Man, especially because it's mm. not just a history of like the last 20, it, like the last 20 years, like what's the history of Spider-Man for the last however many years, 50 years, 50 yeah. years, 50 years. Yeah. So like you have, you have a very, very, um, like I said, we're just kind of stewards that we get to hold the kind of product for a little bit and then. Mm. 10 years from now, there's going to be an, another person that's going to be in charge of it as well. You know, these, these, these franchises and these characters go on forever, you know? Well, yeah, John, this has all been a perfect setup because the other two themes I want to talk about, I want to talk about the Craven, just badass theme. The yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then you were talking about how John Williams didn't have some of those modern instruments and things you could do, sound design. Uh, like, for example, the kind of synth stuff you can do with the symbiote stuff when you take the right. main Peter Parker theme and do the moon. Yeah, the, so yeah, those are the two down. themes I was talking about. And then after you answer that, I am curious from just a straight technical perspective, um, how much of these tracks are you like programming out ahead of time and how much of the programming is making it into the final mix? Like, are, like those synths I'm assuming are either real synths or from plugins or, but like the, like the drums are those programmed drums that you're adding in on top. And that's one it, way you're able to make both. it less I mean, classical. I've, I've, I've never been, for me, I've always been concerned about, I don't care if it's live. I don't care if it's a mock-up. I don't care if it's a very commercial plugin that 5,000 other people have. If it can accomplish what I want it to accomplish from a sonic, you know, from a sonic sound and the storytelling point Mm -hmm. of view, I'll use it. You know what I mean? So everything you hear in these soundtracks is a mixture. It could be, it could, some of it, depending track dependent could be live. It could have just been directly from a plugin I used. It could have been something we worked with a bunch of perk players for, you know, three weeks on getting the exact sound that we wanted to. So some of the short strings, some of the short strings are live. Some of the short strings mm. are fakes because I wanted them to be very metronomic and very tight and very unnatural sounding. You know what I mean? Mm. If you, some mm-hmm. of these things, if you played live with an orchestra, some of the stuff might not even be playable to a degree, you know, yeah. depending on what it is. But if it accomplishes what we're trying to accomplish, we're going to use it, you know? So Hmm. I only, for me, I've always looked at the orchestra as just another instrument. You know what Mm -hmm. I mean? It's like, it's another instrument. It's another tool. Yeah. It's another, it's another tool to use in the creation of these scores. You know, it's not. So do you typically do that last then? Always. Yeah. Just because we want to really be sure it's so expensive. We want to be sure from a, from just a financial and production standpoint that like that stuff's pretty locked in when we go and record it. It's, you you don't want to, you don't want to experiment with, you know, 90 players in a room. It gets expensive. (laughs) So you really, when you go and record these live scores, you definitely want to make sure that stuff's fully approved and you know, it's going to be in the, you know, I mean, you do a little bit of, of, you know, manipulation and a little bit of experiment, experimentation on the stage when you're recording like that. But for the most part, the orchestra, um, is is pretty set in stone and it's and it's there shouldn't be any big surprises on those scoring stages and that's a benefit today with the how we're able to do mock-ups today and how we're able to 
kind of give the, uh, you know, give the executives and the directors and producers a preview of what it's going to sound like is a huge advantage for when you show up on those scoring stages. Cause it wasn't that long ago where, you know, a director would walk into a studio and you would sit at the piano and say, here's what your theme is going to sound like. And you'd play it and they would go, great. I can't wait till we hear it on the orc on the stage with the orchestra. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like mm-hmm. those days, um, if a director came into my studio today and I did that, they would be like, cool. And then they would, get in their car and I would get a call from my agent six minutes later and being like, yeah, you're fired. Like <laughs> they, they need to hear what these scores sound like, you know what I mean? Before they, and I, it's just for better or worse, you know I mean? It's like, if you're working with like a director, you've done a lot of work with in the past and there's that like trust level there and relationship there. Um, yeah. You can get away with a little bit of that these days, but um, there's so many people that these scores have to make it through in order to get like approvals and to get everyone to kind of to sign off before they, you know, give you that big budget to record this stuff live. Um, you really kind of have to have a pretty good representation of what's going on before you, they actually go ahead. And there, there's no such thing as like a demo anymore for us. It's like, I feel like anything can be used just because we, mm-hmm. we really do think of those mock-ups as, we always go through, we always make our mock-ups as if like, there's a chance we might not be able to record this. That's how good we want the mock-up to sound. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. We always want it to sound like it's, it could be used in the game without any further, you know, um, you know, production done on them. Um, right. So that's happened, yeah. that's happened for me. I think just in the generic music world too, like as technology gets better and better demos get so good, that yeah. line gets really bl- blurry. I mean, honestly, Whereas 10 I, years ago, lot, oh, there's a lot of times where I have to fight directors on not using the mock-up and using the live stuff instead, because it's the mock-ups hmm. have a tendency sometimes to be so tight and they get so used to that sound. Demo-itis. Yeah. And they get so used to that sound that you go and you replace it all with live organic music. And I love the live organic stuff honest more than i do like the sound of the mock-ups the mock-ups are very fitting for certain things like the symbiote and things where you want these very Mm. kind of like i said you know metronomic lines where they're very tight and you don't want a lot of looseness but like i love the sound of an organic orchestra in a room with a little bit of looseness to it and not everything like right on the beat and i think it just creates a character that's hard to get with mock-ups kind of to lead into your symbiote question when we were thinking about thematic material for the symbiote in the very, very beginning of the game, I wanted the symbiote to be not so much of a theme, but an element that could infect all God, the other themes. That's so You cool. know what I mean? Because so we, had a, we had a Craven theme. We had a theme for Peter. We had a theme for Miles. We had a theme for Harry. We had like all these different themes. And... That's I was so worried crazy. that I was worried that we were going to get like themeitis, you know what I mean, where you have so many different themes going on that at a certain point it just starts starting to sound like random music, you know what I mean, where the air can only take so much. So when it came to the symbiote, it was like, well, why don't we why don't we create a treatment that could infect these other themes? So when you <laughs> did it to them, you could still use the melodic content of the other themes, but maybe they would bend and warp. Yeah, and, oh yeah, oh yeah, you know, oh they yeah. Would, you know, they mm-hmm. would get like a, you know, a synthetic element to them to where they would, um, where again, like kind of going back to more of this a modern take on things where like you can't really tell this what this, you can't hum what the symbiote theme is, but if you heard it, you'd go like, oh, that's a symbiote. You know what I mean? But you might, it might be, Harry's theme. It might be Peter's theme. Mm -hmm. It might be Miles' theme. And again, it's all kind of taken. It's a kind of, you know, if you, I've always been a big believer that if you just kind of envelop yourself in the story, um, a lot of these kind of thematic ideas will kind of tell them, you know, they'll, 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 they'll rear their head and you'll know kind of how to use them. And it was pretty obvious with the symbiote, like, okay, well, it infects things. You know what I mean? Why can't Mm -hmm. it infect the (laughs) theme? You know? So well, it's so um, good. Mm-hmm. It's like we talked about those themes. It just needs you to know how elite they are. Like it, as a as a musician and as a fan of the game, like to see Craven and have the the audio cue as well. It yeah. works so well. So don't yeah. downplay it. You did such a yeah. good job. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Craven and Craven Craven was a lot of fun too because it was Craven Craven we wanted to do something that you could just hear it for like three seconds and know it's yep. Craven. Uh, you know what I mean? Yeah. And mm. it was also just the rhythm. You know what I mean? The don't, rhythm of it. The, yeah. So you kind of had this, you could hear him coming. You know what I mean? Yeah, like that oh, was it's so good. Idea. Like you could hear him getting closer to you. You could just hear him 
you know. Or as my daughter calls it, the scary track. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You can hear it. Approach. And these are the creative too. There's also an emotional element to it too. Mm-hmm. You yeah. know what I mean? With this cello stuff. I mean, so there was, he's definitely was more of a kind of a complex character than we, you could we the idea it was originally i mean you see craven's costume too like i remember when we were originally getting storyboards for it uh for craven his costume was like so over the top you know <laughs> like the big fur and like uh-huh. the boots like the like the whole thing i remember like the first version i did of craven was such a miss it was like <laughs> It was like all jungly and like, it was, <laughs> it was, it, yeah, it was like cuckoo, you know what I mean? Like, uh-huh. it, like, it, it just, it was like fun. It was a lot of fun, but it was Brian. I remember like Brian heard it and like, he was just kind of like, <laughs> yeah, man, it's like cool. But like, it's, well, it's, and it was, and, and it was, it was funny. We wanted something and it, it totally made sense. Like we needed something to counteract kind of how he looked. Because it uh-huh. would so it would be so easy to do something to Craven, and he would just feel goofy. Well, yeah, yeah. that's the crazy thing is the whole character is goofy in yeah. general. Yeah. But, yeah. but you made him legitimately terrifying with a yeah. Yeah. Too. So like the the idea of like if you if you put my version one over Craven, it was like you know, <laughs> I would like turn him into like <laughs> well, for like lack of a better term, he was like a nineteen seventies you know George the Jungle. Film star. <laughs> <laughs> I think. I mean that that <laughs> is just, what's. That's what's it fascinating was, it about wild. it. You know what I mean? It was so too, it just like <laughs> totally was over the top and you're just I mean, like, oh man, this is not going to work. Um, I do want a bonus track now. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, it's a fun, it's a fun piece of music. It's, I mean, it's just, it was just like, it had all these like chiffy flutes and stuff. <laughs> it was like, I always, I always like junk around. Like I'd be like, like Ron Burgundy, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, <laughs> oh, no. Raven. Um, so maybe there's another game in there somewhere, but That's yeah, funny. no, it was, <laughs> so then like Brian kind of got to me and we like talked about it and he kind of explained, you know, like kind of had to sit me down and kind of explain the character more in depth to me and tell, and like, then it's, uh, I get it, you know, I, I see what he's going for and, um, and it helped, you know what I mean? I think it helps take that character, like you were saying, mm-hmm. and like round him. And you could get away with those visuals. Cause I do love the visuals of Craven. He's so big. Uh-huh. And, um, and it just, yeah, it totally, I mean, it like when I remember when I first saw it the first time, well, we used it twice really early in the process. One of them was for a trailer. It was like a teaser. It was like for the really short teaser. Yeah, it was really early on. And then we used them obviously in like the, um, on the, on the actual like gameplay trailer. Mm. And when I saw that gameplay okay. trailer, I was like, yeah, it's going to work. Like, cause you guys <laughs> wouldn't have really, I don't get like a lot of times I don't really get to hear the music too gameplay or two picture because we kind of work in this weird way in video games different than film where you're like writing you're writing before everything's like developed almost you know what i mean Mm. so you like things are kind of being developed as you're writing but like with pictures i mean a movie like apes and stuff where it's so visual effects heavy you're kind of working in like a similar fashion but like most of the time with picture you're kind of writing to picture you know what i mean like you, Mm -hmm. you get to obviously linear and you're you're not but with the gameplay music they almost need that music uh you know as they're developing because it's such a part of the developmental process so i really don't get to like see finals until like we start getting into that phase so when i was able to first kind of see it at that gameplay trailer i was like oh yeah this is great it's hmm. gonna work you know what i mean so um otherwise you just kind of have to take you know the development team's word and they're like oh it's it's all working it's great 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 and then i finally get to see it i'm like oh yeah they were absolutely right so mm-hmm. it, it definitely worked yeah. out really well. yeah that is i mean that's one of the the things that's wild about the craven character is he has such a a large following in large part due to the the craven's lost hunt story yeah. which is in so many ways such a left turn from the the character's history prior to that and you even see that sometimes with comics creators not quite knowing how to move forward and keep the kind of gravitas of that story, but also stay true to just the clearly ridiculous conception yeah. of Craven. Ridiculous in a, in a fun way. Like, I mean, that's what makes all those kind of Silver Age villains so fun. Uh, but I think that that's why it's, it's, it's really impressive that you found a way to thread that line even, even musically. Uh, yeah, but, I was just glad we got we were able to get out before the movie got out. <laughs> yeah, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, no, yeah, yeah, good point. Because Ben I, uh, is, I think he's doing the score for that. He's an incredible composer. So oh, just, he like, is. Okay, I didn't know that. Out before they did. So that was kind of a fun. <laughs> that was kind of a fun thing because I know he'll probably do an amazing job on that. So well, um, 
speaking of kind of upcoming things here, and I know you can only talk about what you can talk about, but uh, we're really excited to to hear that you're working on the the new Abe stuff. I know that's a movie that yeah. a lot of people are excited about for a lot of reasons. Uh, is there anything else that's coming down? I mean, that, that you we know, can... working it's I, the, I, whether it's a- Apes or any of these other. I did, working with Wes, uh, the director of those movies, who I did the Maze Runner mm. stuff with. It was just mm. it's awesome, just because we grew up on the all the same stuff. We were huge Spielberg fans, huge James mm. Cameron fans. You know, what I mean, so like. It's funny in this business, I've always found that you work with people that are very, that are like you, you know what I mean? Like you, you can cause it is, you know, working on music on these projects is such a collaboration. Like I talked about earlier and, um, mm-hmm. you're, you're kind of in the trenches for a long time, you know, and there's a comfort level that needs to be very, um, the, you have to feel comfortable. Like you would not play. I mean, you want, you have to be in a situation where like, you can feel comfortable telling the composer that you don't like the piece of music. No, this is cheesy. Like, try it again. No, hmm. this is like too much. Right, it feels right. like you have to have that that you know comfort level with somebody because you know you have to figure out. And I always say this: you have to figure out what doesn't work before you figure out what works. And hmm. it's a process. You know what I mean? It's not like you just like show up with great music and no, oh, here it is. Like hmm. do what you will with it. I mean, it's a, it's a grind. I mean, you know, each, a lot of these cues, you go through three, four five different versions, you know? Um, I mean, I, sometimes I, I remember like going through cues on, you know, death cure where they were like version 15, you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. where, you're, where you're, it's a puzzle. You're constantly trying to figure it out. Hmm. And, the great thing about working with someone like Wes is like, you know, and Brian, you know, Brian's the same one. I mean, you look at Brian, you look at me and like, we're like the same guy. Like our hats are always backwards. We're wearing, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like we're just, we're constantly, you know, like, you know, he's a, I'm a, you know, from Detroit, he's from Cleveland. You know what I mean? Like we you just kind yeah, of have a yeah. lot of things in common, you know? So, um, and that's how it is like working with Wes on like apes or the maze runner stuff or, you know, the projects I've been lucky enough to work with them on. It's just so fun creatively because you're, you're always kind of coming from that, you know, nine year old perspective that got you into this business in the first place. And it's just a creatively, it's a lot of, it's, a, it's challenging, but it's a, like, it's a lot of fun. You love, it's the reason why you got into this business. There's, we've all worked on projects before too, where you kind of get thrust into a project, you know, late in the process, or it's just very dominated by other political factors and you have to mm-hmm. kind of just get through it. And there's a lot of different, but like, it's very rare you kind of get to work on these projects where you really get to approach it from like a hundred percent, just creative Mm. you know, influence, you know? And I think mm-hmm. every time I work with wow. Wes, it always feels that way. And same thing with Spider-Man and, and Brian. It's like, I get to work on these projects where it's like, John, block out all the other noise and just think of the story. Think of the creativity. Mm. Think of the music, you know, like, don't worry about this. Don't worry about this. We'll take care of that. You just focus on the music creatively. You know what I mean? And I feel like whenever I work with, in collaborations like that, when I work with people, that trust level gets built up where they kind of, you know, let you just kind of like focus in on the music. And I think that's why I, I don't know. I think it's a coincidence why like John Williams and Steven Spielberg scores are the mm. best for me, at least from my point of view are like the best score. You just feel that freedom in the music. You know what I mean? You don't feel like it's being steered or, you know what I mean? You feel like it's a true collaboration. You can say the same thing, you know, about, you know, like, you know, I love Hans, of course, for the Christopher Nolan projects he's mm-hmm. done. You know, yeah, you know, oh, yeah. They just have this, you, they just have a feel to them. And like, you can tell, like, there's a, there's a, you know, a really great relationship there. And Hans's score for Dune and stuff. I mean, like, you oh, just, yeah. you know, when they're like team, when you, when that, when that chemistry makes sense, the scores always really blossom. You know what I mean? And so, um, <laughs> and there's plenty, plenty examples of collaborations throughout the years, you know, um, you know, Zemeckis and Alan Silvestri, you know what I mean? Like yeah, another yeah. combination of, of director combo, you know what I mean? Where you get these scores that are, whether it's Back to the Future or Forrest Gump mm-hmm. or, you know, so like, and I feel like with Wes, I've been very fortunate to kind of have a partner like that. Um, and I think I'm, I'm, you know, Apes is a big, Apes also too. It's like, talk about a lineage of music. I mean, Jerry yeah. Goldsmith's score for Planet of the Apes is groundbreaking. Hmm. Uh, Michael Giacchino scores for those films are awesome. Mm-hmm. I love those scores. You know, um, I love how he kind of infused 
some of you know the Jerry sound in there, but then his own sound kind of made its way in there. And this film's different, you know. It's it's I can't say much about it, but it's sure. you know, it's Wes has really done an incredible job of like taking taking those worlds and, and making them his own. And it's it's I'm really fortunate to be working on it. Um, and uh, and yeah, and also it's honestly it's the same thing with Brian and 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 the guys over mm. at PlayStation that I work with on these games. It's like. You get spoiled, you know what I mean? You work on projects mm-hmm. like that, and you're just like, these are the only type of things I want to work on. You know what I mean? You <laughs> yeah. don't realize how lucky you are to be able to, like, you know, be able to work on, you know, um, like, limit the amount of work. As, as I kind of get older and kind of go through this business, you really realize you just want to work on projects like this. You know what I mean? And mm-hmm. if you're fortunate enough to be able to listen, you're fortunate enough to let alone have one that, than two. You know what I mean? So, mm-hmm. um yeah, so it's it's uh, it's been a, a great you know last you know decade for sure. Has John, been for us. Yeah, as I say, you're the best. <laughs> we can't wait to hear the new ape stuff. And thank you for making Spider Man too. Gosh, it brings oh, yeah. so much joy to our hearts. Thank you yeah. for doing this. Appreciate you. I appreciate it. Thank you. Man, I am really excited about that new Planet of the Apes film. That's actually something we haven't talked about on this podcast much, but I'm actually a huge fan Same. of those rebooted films. Uh, so to find out that he's scoring, it makes me extra happy too. Well, and it's, uh, it's always fun because we did so much of this in the, in the summer. And then the last few weeks have just been so insane between Loki and the Marvels and then also the Spider-Man 2 coverage. And so I, I, I think that you and I have kind of talked offline about other screensaver things that we're going to get to do now that we've Good got point. a bit of space. And yeah, I think that's a prime candidate for a, a screensaver plus rewatch there because I love those remakes. And also, I have never seen the original Planet of the Apes. You know Which what? is kind of wild. I um, haven't either. I mean, it's just like a, it's a hole in my, uh, my, my I, film I know history. the original story, famously. Right. Um, we should probably do that too. Yeah, so I know. the it would new be at one, least I think it's original. called... The new one's called Kingdom of the Planet of the Apes. That could be screensaver, yeah. right? And then we have some plus episodes by going back through some of those. That'd be real yeah. wild. But, dude, he was talking about, you know, the balance of creating themes for Spider-Man 2 versus not becoming so theme-heavy, which is so fascinating because I feel like that applies to so much of our MCU conversations, mm-hmm. right? Like, we're always talking about, like, so many people on social media have sent us the the meme of someone who took every theme at the end of Endgame and instead of playing the Avengers theme, oh, put like right. everyone's theme. And it's like, it's impressive and it's incredible and all that. But that's a perfect example of like, no, Alan Silvestri knew the perfect balance to not get into doing all that because it would just be such a musical mess. Yeah, And it's yeah. fascinating to hear him talk about that with this game because I think what they settled on, in my opinion, is so perfect mm-hmm. where there are like I mentioned, those three or four musical cues that every time you see Craven, you hear the boom, 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 right. boom, boom, boom. You're like terrified and it's a sweet cue. But he was right to do that. Like the thing he was talking about with the symbiote suit is so perfect. Like take mm-hmm. Peter's theme and as Peter's suit on screen is getting like black, you hear the mm-hmm. dun, 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 you know, like instead. Yeah. Uh, just yeah. I love that conversation. I, I love the, like, anytime I hear a composer talk about really actively trying to channel a story element in that way, where he's like, yeah, good point. He, he's talking about the symbiote, like, have, like, infecting the original scores. And I, I love that idea. It's like, I, I've heard Nicholas Bertel talk about how, like, his score yes. in succession is supposed to be like, it's, it's showing the family moving away like it's like you you get a sense listening mm. if you listen to the theme like in in the the composition he's trying to channel the kind of discord yep. that you feel within the show and it's like i just i feel like that's the kind of thought that sets like great scores apart from it's, good ones. It's it's Hans Zimmer playing with time in, in dreams and inception. Yes. It slows down dun 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 bon, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know. Oh yeah, I love that stuff. If you can take a story element and add it to the music, so cool. Yeah. I hope you guys enjoyed that. John was so kind to join us again. Hopefully now, as a, a true friend of the pod, we can have him back on, like he said, maybe uh later around Planet of the Apes time or whatever. Yeah. Uh Thanks to him. Thank you for listening. We'll see you next time right back here on Friends from Work. Friends from Work.